So as we begin this morning, we're going to continue in our series on community, but I have to say, and I'm not just saying these words, you know, we, we talk about seeing the goodness of God in our lives. I, I honestly can look out of this room and see God's goodness all over the place. And I am so thankful for our community that we have here at Cornerstone. Did you know that we have 24 different cultures represented at Cornerstone? That's pretty good, isn't it? So it, it was on my heart that as we grow as a community, part of that is getting to know each other better. And a part of that is understanding each other's cultures. So in your bulletin, you'll see an insert there. And it, it talks about that a little bit, but I want to invite you after the service to go out underneath the tent, not out in the rain, but underneath the tent. Katrina Aldana is going to share the Filipino culture with us, and she made these things called lumpia. I don't know if you've ever had it before, but oh my goodness. But I'm warning you, it's one of those things like you have one and you want 10 more. So if it's on your heart, if you have something from your culture that you wanted to share with us, uh, you have a food or something that you want to put out there on the, on the patio on the Holy Grounds, come and talk to me. I'd love for us to get to know each other better in community through that culture experience. Okay? So this morning, we are going to continue in our series, uh, our value series, if you will. And over the past few weeks, we've been looking at a few of the key values at Cornerstone. And today, we'll be looking at community. And my, my true prayer is that we walk away with a few more key principles on community and we, we feel a little more connected in the direction that we're going. But if we're being honest, community can mean something different to each one of us in this room, depending on how comfortable you are with, with other people, right? Today, let's look at our true value statement. Let's, we're gonna put it up here on the screen. Here's our, our value statement on community. There it is. So if you'd be so kind, let's read that out loud together. We are a Christ-centered intergenerational community that provides mutual care and support through authentic relationships. So oftentimes, we, we look at the church model and community, and people point to the church in Acts, in Acts chapter 2. And they say, well, Acts 2, we want to be the Acts church. We want to look like the Acts church. So we're going to take a look at that passage today. Actually, we're going to be looking at two passages today. So we're going to start in Acts 2, and then we're going to flip over to Hebrews 10. But if you're so kind, if you haven't already, let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verses 40, 42 through 47. And if you'd be so kind to stand for the reading of God's word. So Acts 2, 42 through 47, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Thank you. You may be seated. What a great model of a church, of the, of the church community. This is a community that was devoted to teaching and fellowship. A community that, was, that met together every day over God's word. A community that provided for each other. But, but what brought them to that point? What got them to that point that they were willing to, to sell all their possessions and they gathered together every single day? It was important we understand a little bit of context to what they're talking about here. In Acts 2, this takes place right after Pentecost. Everyone was gathered in Jerusalem all, from all over, different countries and different territories to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit came down upon the apostles that were gathered there for the, the Feast at Pentecost. And the apostles started to speak in different languages as the Spirit came upon them. And other people that were there were, were coming around and noticing that this was happening and say, wait a second, aren't all of these Galileans? How is it that they are speaking in a language from my homeland that I can understand them? How, how is this possible? And as they, as they gathered and were amazed and the crowd started to come together, Peter had the opportunity to witness to them to share the gospel. And as a result, 3,000 people came to faith that day. 
They were baptized, they accepted Jesus. And again, they were from from different territories, from from all over the place. And they were gonna take this message, this gospel back to their homeland. And and we're not clear when it talks about the, the Acts church, if this is what was taking place in each of those communities, or if this was all the people that were gathered, those 3,000, and they decided to stay there in that, in that location. And as a result, this is what happened. But essentially, this was the first church. This was the first church community. And it is a great model, a community that was devoted to teaching and fellowship, that gathered every day over God's word, and that provided for each other. Yes, Mike, that, that's a great model, but I don't see us selling all our possessions and, and pooling them together so we can live like that. That's not what this, this passage is about. I want us to understand, don't miss this, this isn't an instruction manual, okay? This is about their hearts. This is about, they accepted Jesus as a result. This was the result of their hearts, the overflow of who Jesus was in their life. This is where their hearts were at. They were devoted to one another because they were devoted to Christ. So how do we grow as a community? How do we learn to live in such a way that God is glorified through all that we do together? So there's three key principles I want us to look at today. So take your Bible and open to Hebrews 10, verses 24 through 25. So as we look at these three principles, key principles to honor God and to show value to our community. What does that, what does that look like? And, and I'll put the passage up here on, on the screen as well. But Hebrews 25, 20, excuse me, 10, 24 through 25 says this, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. So we have that up on the screen in front of us. I I want us to look at that passage. And the first thing that I I see when I look at this passage is the statement, one another. They were focused not on themselves, but one another. How do we one another? What does one anothering look like? Well, Mike, that's not even a word. What does it look like to one another each other? One anothering. I think that's a new term we need to use here at the church. One anothering. What does it look like for us to one another? Look back at verse 24. The first principle I want us to see is this. We need to consider one another. So consider translates to think about, perceive, fix your eyes, or your mind on, to be attentive. Because community doesn't start when we gather in the same room. Community starts when we start to consider one another. An example of this would be in parenting. If you're a parent, you can understand this. We consider our kids beyond just the time that we're with them. We need to think about their needs, how they're doing in school, their health, their development. We don't just parent when they're in the room with us. We are constantly considering their needs, constantly thinking about them. Well, the same principle applies to community. We have to consider someone else before meaningful relationships and community can take place. You have to be thinking about the other people and not not just yourself and what what you're going to get out of it. If we're going to have deep and meaningful relationships and community is truly going to take place here, we need to consider one another. Great, Mike. I do consider other people. I consider them difficult. (laughs) I consider ways that I can avoid them. I consider them annoying. Some of you are thinking that this shallow small group sounds pretty good. Why is it that community can get messy? You know, we we strive for this this community and we say we're this community, but the reality is sometimes it gets uncomfortable. Sometimes it gets messy, doesn't it? And often that's because of our own pride. Pride because we tend to define community by what we get out of it rather than what we contribute to it. It's, it's me, me, me. I have these expectations of, of what my community is supposed to do for me. 
And when that doesn't happen, that, that's where the, the messiness comes in. That's where the, the struggles with how we define our own community steps in. We need to learn to look beyond ourselves and consider others. When we learn to consider someone else, it means applying biblical principles. It means that you're going to have to swallow your pride. The Bible is clear. It tells us, consider others more important than yourself. When was the last time you did that? See, we tend to compartmentalize our community. And when we gather together, that, that's when our community starts. But it needs to go way beyond that. Again, community doesn't just happen when we're together. It starts when we consider one another. We need to spend time getting to know one another. Getting to know each other's circumstances. What's happening in your life? Getting to know each other's struggles. Getting to know each other's strengths. How can I best serve you if I don't even know you? Have I taken the time to consider the other people in my community or am I just focused on me and what I'm going to get out of it? We need to consider one another. So how else do we grow in community that honors God and shows value to others? Look again at verse 24 with me. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. We need to spur one another. Some of your translation may say stir up, but we need to spur one another. So what does it mean to spur one another? The, the Greek word here it translates actually to provoke or irritate. Oh, Mike, we got that one down. We can irritate, irritate each other, no problem. It's, it's, you got to think of it this way. It's, it's kind of like if you have a fat cow that doesn't want to move and you got to take a stick and get them moving in the right direction. Mike, did you just compare us to cows? No. <laughs> the idea is the same. How do we get each other moving? To spur someone is to get them moving in the right directions, to move in their steps of faith. See, in shallow small groups, they talked about wanting to avoid conflict like the plague. That's not what this is about. This isn't conflict that we're talking about here. It's learning to ask the right questions. How, how do I spur you on? It's asking the questions of, how's your prayer life? How you doing with purity? How you doing with your thoughts, with, with anger? How are you doing with reading your Bible? This is how we spur one another on. So the question is, do you love one another to ask the uncomfortable questions? Because if that sounds like the shallow small group, it's like, I, I don't want to ask these questions. I don't, I don't want to ask how your prayer life is going because the truth is you might turn around and ask me how mine is going. Am I wrong? Sometimes we avoid asking these questions of spurring each other on because we're afraid that it's going to come right back onto us. And what happens if somebody asks me those questions? And, and we want to be a polite community. We want everybody to get along and we all want to be nice to each other. So we just, there's things we just don't talk about. So we're going to come together and we're going to study and we're going to do all these things and we're going to smile and everything's going to be great. It doesn't mean we don't share our struggles, but do we spur one another? Let me explain it this way. Anybody ever have to read Homer's Odyssey in high school? Some of you are like, I read that for fun. Why? <laughs> Why? I read the TV guide. That's about it. So Homer's Odyssey, the story of a man called Odysseus. And Odysseus is on his journey back home. And he's on his boat with his men. And they know they have to pass by this island. And this island is famous for having sirens. Now, a siren was a mythical creature that was half bird and half woman. It, almost akin to a mermaid, if you will, but a bird version of that. And these sirens could sing the most beautiful songs. 
And as they sang this song, it would, it would lure the men in. It would lure the men on their, their ship and so we have to go towards that. It would drive them mad with desire of wanting to be closer to that sound. And every ship that went by that heard those sirens, guess what happened? They were lured in and they crashed on the rocks of that island and the sirens would devour them. So Odysseus and his men know they're coming to this island and the sirens are gonna, are gonna sing their song. So he has this plan. He says, let's take some beeswax, make it a little pellets and put it in your ears. So he did that with all of his men. But Odysseus, Odysseus says, I wanna hear the sirens. I have to know what this sounds like. So his men tied him to the mast. And here was the instruction he gave them. As I say, let me go, tie the ropes tighter. The more I say, this is what I want, don't give in. Tie the ropes all the tighter. See, what he's essentially saying is, do what I need, not what I want. We need to do that. We need to provoke each other. Provoke me, ask me those deep questions. Give me accountability. A ask me those things that I ne maybe necessarily don't want to hear, but I need to hear. Tell me that premarital sex is wrong lest I crash into the rocks. Tell me that harboring anger towards my brother it is wrong lest I, I destroy the relationship. Call me out. Tell me that the bitterness towards my spouse is wrong lest I, I crash into that island. See, but we're surrounded by sirens in this world. We are surrounded by things that can lure us in and drive us mad with desire to go in the wrong direction. And we need each other, my friends. We need to watch out for each other. We need to be willing to ask the uncomfortable questions. We need to spur one another on in a way that we tell each other what we need to hear, not just what we want to hear. Don't settle just for the shallow small group. Okay, don't miss this. It doesn't mean you get to be the sin police, okay? It doesn't mean I want you walking around looking for sin in someone's life so that you can point it out. Well, I heard Mike say on Sunday morning that, so here's the list of all the sin that I see in your life. No. How do we spur one another on? You're in community. You're in this relationship. And, and it's not about just, hey, let me make a list of the sins in your life. It's, let me warn you that you're going to crash into those rocks. Let me show you that you, you need to get moving, that I need to provoke you, that, that we got to go in the right direction and take these steps in our faith. It, it's about, a, it's a safeguard. It's adding accountability and a rebuke in a way that encourages them towards love and good deeds. Can you do it in a way that spurs somebody towards love? That's not pointing the finger, is it? How do we come alongside each other in community? You consider one another, and then you spur one another. Have you ever been on the receiving end of that? Has somebody ever came and gave you correction or rebuke, and they, they call you out? There tends to be a couple of uh, reactions that we have. Most likely, the walls of defense go up, right? And we make a statement like, look at the plank in your own eye. Don't, don't start pointing out the stuff in my life when you have so much that I can point out in your life. And our pride gets in the way. And we want to make it all about the other person rather than accepting what they're saying, thinking that maybe they've been considering this for a while. And they need to tie the ropes all the tighter to that mast because I'm heading the right direction and maybe I don't see it. So we can get defensive and we can let our pride step in or we can say, my brother loved me enough to spur me on towards love and good deeds. To show me that I, I'm going the wrong direction. 
So what else? There's one more principle in that passage that's found in verse 25. Look back there with me. Not giving up meeting together as some in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. I wanna hit the brakes here for a second. Before we get to that, that third principle, I want you to look up at this passage and see, it says, whether they were meeting together, not giving up the habit of doing so. Whether we're in the passage of Acts where it says they gathered every day, they gathered in, in the temple and they were in this area called Solomon's portico, Solomon's porch out front. And they would, they would gather for that instruction, but they, they met together. And this church was saying the same thing. Don't give up meeting together. But I believe this is referring to more than just Sunday morning. It's really hard to one another, each other on a Sunday morning. Community tends to happen in circles, not in rows. We need to find our community outside of Sunday morning context. As we consider one another, as we spur one another on throughout the week, your discipleship groups are so important for this. The Acts Church would, would meet together in Solomon's portico, right? And they would hear the instruction, the, the teaching. And then throughout the week, they were together. They were in each other's homes. They were talking about that. They were spurring each other on, encouraging one another. It's really hard on a Sunday morning because it's designed to go one way, isn't it? You, you come together and you, you hear and we worship together, but it's calling us to do more than that. Go outside of Sunday morning when you start thinking about your community definition. We need to be committed to meeting together. And let, let me say this, it matters that you're here. It matters that you're here on Sunday morning. It matters that you're at your discipleship group. It matters that you show up at your friend's house when they're in need. We say, no, I, I'm good with the, the shallow group model, Mike. I can show up on Sunday morning or I can miss Sunday morning. It doesn't matter. It matters. You're thinking about what you're going to get out of it, but do you ever consider that we need you? We need your gifts. We need your encouragement in our life. What difference have you made in someone's life for Christ this week? Are you thinking about community and meeting together on Sunday morning and just making it about what you're getting out of it instead of how can I honor God this morning? How can I spur somebody on? How can I consider somebody this morning? It matters that you're here. So back to verse 25. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. And this is where we get our final principle. Look at it. We need to encourage one another. The Greek word here is translated to comfort, to console, to strengthen. The word is parakaleo. It means call alongside. It's actually the same word that they use in John to describe the Holy Spirit as he comforts us. Parakaleo. Call alongside. How do we encourage one another? Do you know what a great example of encouragement is? Geese. Mike, did you say geese? Yes, I said geese. The Canadian goose is one of my favorite animals. I, I, I see them and the coloring and everything. It's just a, a beautiful creature. And most of you are familiar. You see them flying in the V formation above the housing. <laughs> hey, that was good. And you hear them and you look up and you see them flying in this V formation, right? We're familiar with this, with this picture. But do you know why they do that? Some of you do and some of you don't. So in case you don't know why, it's about lift. Okay, the one in the front is flapping his wings. That's actually causing a current behind him with an updraft, with lift, just off to the side of him. So if they, if they form the V formation, the geese in the back are getting a lift and it's easier for them to fly. The one up the front is doing the hard work in that moment. Did you know that studies have shown, that people study this, I don't know. People, studies have shown that geese can fly 71% farther 
when they do this formation and they share the workload, when they're working together, 71% farther. And they take turns, that, that goose up front, he, he may be getting tired, so he drops behind. And, and the other one comes to the front and they take turns carrying that load. They go 71% farther. I had one of our professors at the eight o'clock service come to me between services and he goes, Mike, do you know why sometimes you see one of the lines longer on one side? And I'm waiting for the scientific answer. And he goes, because there's more birds there. <laughs> so if you see Jeff Swearing, <laughs> he had me. He had, why? Teach me. Tell me. There's more birds. <laughs> All right. But do you know why when they're flying, you hear the, the honking. <laughs> Do you know why you're hearing that? Encouragement. Encouragement. If you, if you look at the birds, the ones in the front are not the ones honking, it's the ones in the back. And the ones in the back are saying, keep up the speed. We're, we're here in formation with you. You need to keep moving. And they're doing their, their honking and, and saying, go, encouragement. But there's something new that I learned this week about geese that I didn't, I didn't know before. So if one of, they're flying this formation, if one of them gets hurt or gets tired or gets sick and has to go land, two other geese will go with it. Right? Oh. <laughs> two other geese will go with it and they will stay with it until it either dies or is healthy enough to fly again. And then they form that V formation together and go. New outlook at geese, right? <laughs> See, encouragement, as they, as they go down and they're with that other, that other goose that's not doing so well, I want us to understand that encouragement goes beyond just our actions and our words. Sometimes it's just being present. Just being present like those other two geese. It reminds me of a passage in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 says this, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity one, anyone who falls and does not have somebody to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? The one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands cannot quickly be broken. My friends, we need each other. The song says, in Christ alone, not alone in Christ. We need each other. Whether it's just being present, whether it's just encouraging us to keep going. But it's something that I've realized that community can show us our need to grow. I look at my marriage. Before I got married, I thought I was an amazing guy. I was nice to me. I was kind to me. I considered myself all the time. It wasn't until I got married that the areas of my life where I needed to grow were really revealed to me. And we do the same thing in our parenting. Every one of you in this room was the perfect parent before you had kids. You sat in the grocery store and you watched somebody melt down and you said, I will never allow my child to do that. You're at the restaurant and you see the two-year-old that has a phone and you're like, never. And then you became a parent. <laughs> I publicly want to apologize to every parent that I judged prior to having my own kids. But we're, as parents, it often reveals to us through these little mimics that we have. The other day we're driving. And I, I hear from the back seat, oh, come on, why are you going so slow? Wonder where they learned that. <laughs> from a six-year-old, they're mimicking dad. Man, community sometimes can show us areas that, that we need to grow and we, we need to stay together. It reminds me of the story of Elijah. Elijah the prophet, remember Mount Carmel? He, he calls down fire from heaven. An amazing story, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. But right after that, Jezebel, the king's wife, 
threatens his life. Says, Elijah, I'm gonna kill you. So what does Elijah do? He takes off running. He gets scared and he takes off to Beersheba. But we're told in that passage that along the way, he left behind his servant. Essentially, he left behind his encouragement and his help. And what happened to Elijah? He, he started to have this pity party. And, and he started to say statements like, I'm the only one left. It tells us there was thousands of others. You weren't alone in this, Elijah. But he separated himself from his community. He separated himself, isolated himself. And he started thinking differently. And the same thing happens in our lives when we isolate ourselves, when we leave community. We don't always see things as they are. We get emotional about things and we start saying the woe is me's and like everybody just feels like they're against us and we want to isolate ourselves. And maybe we, we get down and we get depressed. We need each other, my friends. We need to come alongside each other. We cannot isolate ourselves. So in coming to our take-home truth this morning, it's important to all of us to, to see this coming together in community. It's about where our hearts are at, not just our actions towards one another. I can consider you. I can spur you on. I can even be present with you. But if I'm not doing it out of love, it's not true community. It's about where our hearts are at. If your heart's in the right place, when you consider somebody, that looks really different, doesn't it? If your heart is in the right place and you're spurring somebody along, it looks different. When your heart's in the right place and you're encouraging somebody, it's the way that we need to do it. It's about who God is in your life. Our take-home truth is this. Biblical community is based on God's glory, not on our comfort. It's not just about what you can get out of it. You ever think about God's glory when you're coming together? In spite of all our differences, the commonality we have is God. That's the only thing that's going to hold us together. Let's not forget that we were created to glorify God. If we were created to glorify God, how much more can we do if we do it together? 71%? We were not designed to be alone. Look back at Genesis. It's not good for man to be alone. Look at Elijah, what happens when he separates himself. Look at your own life. We were designed to be in community, but what does that community look like? It's laying it out for us right here. But see, we tend to handpick the people in our community that, that make us feel good. This is going to be my community circle, and these are all the people that make me feel good about myself. And, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But let me ask you this morning, are you willing to go outside of your comfort zone for God's glory? Are you willing to look at community differently? See, this passage in Acts that we read this morning told us that God added to their numbers daily. And that's our same prayer here, that God would add to our numbers. But I'm not talking about Sunday morning. I'm not talking about filling more seats in here. See, what we're praying for is his kingdom to grow, for his glory. We're looking to God to use us in all areas, whether it's at work or at school, in our neighborhoods, at home, and on Sunday morning. But as he does that, we have to be open to accept new people. But we also have to be open to accept the ones that he already has right in front of us. Have you created this model in your life that's just this shallow small group? And this is where I'm comfortable. This is, this is my little safe zone. And I'm going to stay in this box and I don't want anybody else to come near and you're focused on everything that you want to get out of it, are you willing to go outside of that comfort zone for God's glory? We need to be thinking about what we can contribute to community rather than what we can just get out of it. 
And today I pray that as we examine our hearts, that God would reveal to us any any areas in our heart that are, are barriers or obstacles that are keeping us from loving one another, truly loving one another as he loves us. That looks very different, doesn't it? I can love you according to how I think you should be loved, but what does it look like for me to love you as Christ loves you? I'm gonna have to go outside my comfort zone. I'm gonna have to be willing to spur you on and ask those uncomfortable questions. I'm gonna have to be willing to have those questions asked to me. So I leave you with this challenge this morning. Who could you want another this week? Who has God placed in your community that you can want another? Are Are you considering them and spurring them and encouraging them? And if you're on the receiving end of that, I pray that you truly see it as a gift. That my sister, that my brother loves me enough. I I get that phone call that they're just thinking about me. They're going to Costco and they want to know if I need anything. I I heard you're sick. Can I help with the kids? How do we consider in all those things? But along the way, are we going to ask those questions? How's your prayer life? You reading your Bible? How do we love one another properly for his glory, not our comfort? Let's pray. Father, we we thank you truly for the community that we have here at Cornerstone, a community that you have created. Each one of the people here is here because you called them to be here. And we recognize that. And I I pray as we, we talk about these things this morning that the walls just aren't going up, but we truly take it to heart and say, what does it look like to one love one another as you love us? That as we do these things, as we go about our, our days and we, we study together and we worship together and we pray and we, we mourn together, that we love each other in a way that's an overflow of who you are in our lives. And I pray as others see that, that they are attracted to that, that you do add to our numbers daily, that the number of people that are gonna be in your kingdom for your glory. I pray that when they see the Cornerstone community, they say, that's something that I wanna be a part of. Lord, we need your help in this. We need your strength. We need your, your wisdom and your guidance. So we pray this morning that you would do that very thing, Lord, that you would show us how to best love each other in our community, Lord, that you may be glorified through all of it. We pray these things in your name, amen.